In the past year, hearing of war on the news has come as no surprise to us. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it seems like every other outlet has been keeping us updated on the horrors unfolding in the country. However, there is one war that almost no one outside the people suffering through it knows exists. One that the media won't cover and that the government denies even exists. One that has managed to claim the lives of over 6,000 civilians while the world remains silent. This is the shockingly sad story of Myanmar's hidden war. Located in the southeast region of Asia and sharing borders with India, Bangladesh, and Thailand, Myanmar, also known as Burma, is a country with a rich history and culture. Studded with lush jungles, mountains, rivers, beautiful ancient temples, and incredibly diverse people with different languages and ethnic groups. With a population of over 50 million people, Myanmar's natural beauty and rich cultural heritage is truly a sight to behold. However, Despite all the beauty and wonder to behold in the country, Myanmar has been wrought with various ethnic conflicts, human rights issues, and economic development hurdles since gaining independence from the British in January 1948. Myanmar had been running on a partial democracy for 10 years, the political unrest and turmoil coming to a much-needed moment of stillness. Unfortunately, it was on the morning of the 1st of February 2021 in Naypyidaw, the capital of Myanmar that a coup d'etat would take place, starting what would become the war that the world hadn't heard of. The 2021 coup isn't some new issue brought by a present problem. It has deep roots in Myanmar's history. As mentioned earlier, Myanmar has been plagued by political instability since its independence. In September 1958, the military formed a temporary caretaker government under the leadership of U Nu, the first prime minister of Burma. This arrangement was made to resolve political infighting, and in 1960, the military voluntarily restored civilian government after an election. It seemed that Burma would finally be at peace as a democratic nation. However, less than two years later, the military seized power in the 1962 coup, which plunged the country into 26 years of military rule. The end of that regime came after civil unrest, sparked by economic mismanagement, led to another election in 1990. The military allowed this election under the belief that the people actually wanted them in power and that they would surely win. Much to their displeasure, the National League for Democracy, the party that pro-democracy activist and daughter of the country's modern founder, Aung San Suu Kyi, ran under, won the election in a landslide victory. Unable to let go of the power they wielded, the military refused to cede power and placed Aung San Suu Kyi under house arrest. The citizens of Myanmar were subject to another 22 years of military dictatorship, and Aung San Suu Kyi remained detained for 15 out of those years. While detained, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and in 2012, she became a member of parliament. Myanmar's military dictatorship lasted until 2011, when the military began to steadily relinquish power to a civilian government. The process was shaky at best, with everyone waiting in bated breath as the 2015 elections took place. Again, the elections resulted in the NLD's victory, and this time, the military relinquished power to the civilian government, although it couldn't really be called that. According to the 2008 Constitution of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar, which came into effect on the 31st of January 2011 and remained in use after the elections, the Tatmadaw, or the Myanmar Armed Forces, retained significant control of the government. 25% of seats in the parliament were reserved for serving military officers, and certain ministerial positions had to be held by serving military officers. In addition, the military was slated to appoint one of the country's two vice presidents. It's clear that, although Myanmar's government seemed to be democratic, the military still had a firm grip over civilian affairs. It would seem that the military would be satisfied with the power they already wielded by way of a constitution they essentially constructed but come 2020, everything would change. On the 8th of November 2020, another general election took place in Myanmar. The result of it was devastating for the military. Out of the 476 seats in the Myanmar parliament, the military's political party, the Union Solidarity and Development Party, won 33 seats. The NLD won 396. Clearly unsatisfied with the results, the army decided to retaliate. Alleging fraud, the Tatmadaw vehemently disputed the results of the 2020 elections. 
They claim that there were 8.6 million voter irregularities. However, they never presented any evidence to back this up. A day before the Parliament of Myanmar was due to swear in the members elected at the 2020 election, on the morning of the 1st of February 2020, the Tatmadaw staged a coup d'etat. The coup attempt had been rumored for several days. It was something everyone had heard was coming but still hoped against all hope wouldn't happen. Concerned statements came from different nations, such as the United States, Australia, France, and the United Kingdom. But in the end, the coup took place. The military successfully deposed the Myanmar president, Win Myint, along with Aung San Suu Kyi and other members of the National League for Democracy. Aung San Suu Kyi was imprisoned on corruption charges. After those officials were detained in those early morning raids, acting president Myint Sui proclaimed a year-long state of emergency. Myint Sui is not only the first vice president of Myanmar, but also the former vice president of the country. Myint Sui is a retired lieutenant general in the Myanmar army and a member of the military proxy party, the Union Solidarity and Development Party. His political career has always been geared towards ensuring the Tatmadaw's influence in Myanmar's government. After he was declared the acting president by the Tatmadaw and proclaimed a state of emergency, he immediately formally transferred power to the commander-in-chief of defense services and coup leader Min Aung Hlaing. Since the coup, Myin Sui has been scarce from the public eye, and Min Aung Hlaing has been leading as the de facto ruler of the country. He once worked closely with Aung San Suu Kyi, and he ended up leading the coup. The Tatmadaw declared that the results of the 2020 general election were invalid. The military junta announced that a new general election, one that would be monitored to avoid those election irregularities, would be held at the end of the state of emergency. However, more than two years have passed since the coup with no sign of the military relinquishing power. Min Aung Hlaing promised free and fair elections, but since the coup, the state of emergency keeps getting extended while his government comes under international scrutiny for human rights abuses in Myanmar. The country has been isolated across the Western world, leading to trade sanctions from multiple countries. In June 2021, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution requesting that member states impose an arms embargo on Myanmar. Since the coup, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, has blocked Myanmar from participating in regional summits. Neighboring countries have also taken their sides in the conflict, with Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Singapore strongly opposing the military junta, while Thailand supports and is a key ally of the Tatmadaw. Individuals and organizations associated with the Tatmadaw have also received sanctions from the United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union. However, these have been revealed to be non-effective. Poor coordination among the governments and lack of substantial targets means the sanctions put in place by those countries fail to serve as proper retaliation against the military junta. Also, the military simply channels funds through affiliated firms in order to avoid international sanctions. Moreover, the UK and US governments have failed to hit the junta where it actually hurts by sanctioning the Myanmar Oil and Gas Enterprise, MOGE, the country's largest source of foreign currency. International organizations such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have attempted to pressure the UN and member states into adopting a global arms embargo that would surely affect the conflict that was about to start brewing in Myanmar. Unfortunately, this never came to be and the dire situation only got worse. But before the sanctions started rolling in on the 16th of April, pro-democracy politician Min Ko Nang announced the formation of the National Unity Government. The group is essentially the Myanmar government in exile, consisting of a group of elected lawmakers and members of parliament that were deposed off in the 2021 coup d'etat, as well as members of ethnic minority groups in senior roles. He announced that Aung San Suu Kyi and Win Myint would retain their positions while the Kachin and Karen minority members would have top priority in the new parallel government. Min Ko Nang also asked the international community to recognize the junta. Following the coup, pro-democracy groups in the country rallied around the national unity government. On the 5th of May, the NUG announced the formation of the People's Defense Force, or the PDF, an armed wing of the NUG that was formed to primarily protect NUG supporters from military junta attacks and to fight against the junta. 
The PDF was also heralded as the first step towards the formation of a federal Union army to battle the military junta. That date is regarded as the start of the Myanmar Civil War, but the severity of the situation didn't really register until the 23rd of that same month when the PDF clashed with the Tatmadaw in Meuse, the capital of Mu Se Township in northern Shan State, Myanmar and a major regional trade hub with China. The PDF killed at least 13 members of Myanmar's security forces, marking the beginning of brutal fighting between the military and the opposition. In early June, another fight broke out between the Tatmadaw and the pro-democracy troops in Mayawadi district, a district of Karen State in southeast Myanmar. There, the military and Karen Border Guard Force, BGF, fought alongside Karen ethnic armed groups and the PDF, leaving dozens of junta soldiers dead. In Wale, a town in Karen State, the fighting has forced over 400 residents hoping to cross into neighboring Thailand into May Sot. Muse and Karen weren't the only places in Myanmar subject to brutal fighting. In Kaya State in eastern Myanmar, members of the Kareni People's Defense Force, KPDF, succeeded in destroying several Tatmadaw outposts. The Tatmadaw retaliated by performing helicopter strikes on the PDF in Loikau, the capital of Kaya State and Damoso. In Katha Township, the armed military wing of the Kachin Independence Organization, a political group of ethnic Kachins in northern Myanmar, known as the Kachin Independence Army, joined the PDF in battling junta troops. Eight regime soldiers were killed in the altercation. Fighting continues all over Myanmar in Momok, Putao, and Hapakant townships, in which the junta's attacks have driven out tens of thousands of people from their towns and villages. In retaliation for the PDF's attacks, junta forces raided a PDF safe house in the city of Mandalay and detained several fighters. The Tatmadaw also killed about 25 people in a fight with the opposition in Tabayin. The bloody back and forth continued in Ganga Township, where 50 Tatmadaw soldiers were killed in a series of landmine attacks. The series of offensive attacks that the opposition launched against the junta meant that by 2022, they controlled a substantial part of the now sparsely populated Myanmar territory. The Tatmadaw has the support of China and Russia, who support them with weapons and materials. To put things into perspective, the Russian government and the military junta have become allies as the war carries on. Russia has supplied the Tatmadaw with resources, ammunition, and diplomatic backing. Min Aung Hlaing has visited Russia several times, and has personally met with Vladimir Putin on one noted occasion. The military government also backed the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Despite their backing from large nations, in February 2023, Min Aung Hlaing admitted to having lost stable control over more than a third of townships to the opposition. However, many note that the number of territories held by the PDF is far greater than what Min Aung Hlaing mentioned. Independent observers put the number of Tatmadaw-controlled states at just about 72 out of 330 townships in Myanmar, with all major population centers remaining under stable control. Based on these numbers, it is clear that the military does not control large portions of the country, and these battles form the bulk of the fighting. Although the fighting began early in the year, an official declaration of war wasn't made until the 7th of September. On that day, the NUG declared a state of emergency in Myanmar and launched a people's defensive war against the Tatmadaw. This declaration only increased the clashes between the PDF, other anti-coup forces, and the military junta. In the Magway region, over 17 people have been killed in the aforementioned clashes. The NUG claimed that over 1,700 junta soldiers had been killed and 630 wounded in fighting back in September. But since then, Multiple major battles have taken place in various states and regions all over Myanmar, most notably in Sagaing region, Chin state, Kaya, Magwe region, and Shan state. Reports from the Tatmadaw-controlled media came forward in October that at least 406 junta informants had been killed and 285 wounded since the 1st of February in targeted attacks by resistance forces. Currently, the military junta remains in control of Myanmar, suppressing dissent with violence, arrests, and torture. Anti-coup protests and the PDF fighters launching grueling attacks against the military junta have been challenging the junta, but they're no more than protesters facing a strong military with backing from powerful nations. 
The state of emergency was only supposed to last a year, with another election being held and Myanmar returning to their, albeit shaky and highly military-influenced, democracy. However, there seems to be no end in sight to the conflict. With all these reports of clashes in states, townships, and towns all over Myanmar, who truly suffers? What has happened to the civilians, the true victims of this bloody civil conflict? Back in September 2022, it was reported that about 1.3 million people had been internally displaced. Since the beginning of the conflict, schools have been used by both the Tatmadaw and the PDF as bases and detention sites. Violent attacks on schools became the norm, with over 190 of them being reported in 13 of Myanmar's states and regions back in 2021. As for the students in them, over 13,000 children have been killed in the war, with 7.8 million children remaining out of school while the conflict drags on. The Tatmadaw has also been committing wall crimes all over Myanmar, murdering, torturing their detainees, committing sexual violence, and purposely targeting civilians. The junta has also seized, and in some cases burnt down, the properties of political opponents as part of their intimidation strategy. Thousands of families have been impacted by the brutal war, with the UN estimating that about 17.6 million people in Myanmar required humanitarian assistance back in March 2023, and putting the number of internally displaced at a chilling 1.6 million. They also calculated that 55,000 civilian buildings have been destroyed since the coup. More than 450,000 people have been forced to abandon their homes for fear of their safety. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs put the number of Burmese people who have fled to neighboring countries at well over 40,000. Between March and June 2022, almost 10,000 people per month left the country through official channels, and the number is surely higher if those that fled through unofficial means are counted. Another sector affected by the civil conflict is the country's public health system. Poverty in the country has also doubled since the coup. The value of the Burmese kayat has fallen by over 60%. The price of basic commodities has greatly increased, and citizens are stuck in a food security crisis due to the inability of importers to provide basic products like medicines and fertilizers, resulting in shortages all over Myanmar. The job market has more or less completely crashed since the time of the coup and now. The foreign currency controls the military junta imposed have worsened the shortage of U.S. dollars among international firms operating in the country, and the insecurity has left workplaces empty. Foreign and multinational companies like Telenor, Uradu Chevron, and British American Tobacco have exited the Burmese market as the conflict has intensified, leaving many without work. The shocking and saddening story of Myanmar's hidden civil conflict reveals a grim reality that will soon grow too large to ignore. The severity of the long-standing civil conflict has unleashed untold suffering upon the nation, with countless innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. Families have been torn apart, lives ended in bloody and disturbing ways, and entire communities disrupted. The human cost is immeasurable. Beyond the horrible stories of civilians being caught in the crossfire, the war's impact has destroyed Myanmar's economy. Opportunities for growth, development, and progress have been stifled, leaving the economy in tatters and the future uncertain. Equally concerning is the unsettling silence that surrounds this devastating situation. The lack of attention the atrocities taking place in Myanmar has gotten is a disservice to humanity. The plight of the people, the struggle for survival, and the urgent need for global awareness and intervention remain shrouded in obscurity. However, foreign countries remain sloppy in doing anything substantial, and most people outside Myanmar don't know what's happening within the country. It's important that we lift the veil of silence and shine a spotlight on the tragic realities faced by the people of Myanmar. This conflict must be acknowledged and condemned, and hopefully an end to it will finally come so the people can work on restoring hope to a nation in desperate need.